pickpockets or worse, was ever present. It was said that at night in Covent Garden, you couldn't walk the few hundred yards between the Rose Tavern and Button's Coffee House without risking your life. Twice. Since the Middle Ages, the enforcement of law and order in London had been haphazard, the responsibility of individual parishes. Night watchmen, or Charlies as they were known, were notoriously vulnerable to gangs of drunks or roarers. The growth of London demanded more effective measures of control. In the 1750s, the novelist and magistrate Henry Fielding established in his own house here in Bow Street a police office which acted as a kind of headquarters for the suppression of London crime. I had the most eager desire of demolishing gangs of villains and cutthroats. So, I had a set of thief-takers enlisted into my service, all men known, approved, faithful, and intrepid. These Bow Street runners were also known as Robin Redbreasts, or raw lobsters, because of their red vests. At first, there were only six of them for the entire city. Fielding realised that London had become an urban jungle, a lawless wilderness of crime and violence, and it was getting worse. The growth of London led to severe overcrowding in its maze-like streets. Too many people in too small a space engendered strange fevers and excitements, an undifferentiated mass of common human beings who posed a threat to order and security. And nowhere was more crowded than the parish of St Giles. St Giles was the intercessionary saint for beggars and cripples. In the 12th century, this was the site of a leper hospital set amid marshland. Here stands the resurrection gate, where the condemned paused on their final fatal journey to Tyburn. In the parish of St Giles, there are a great number of houses set apart for the reception of idle persons and vagabonds who have their lodgings there for tuppence a night. Here, men and women, often strangers to each other, lie promiscuously, the price of a double bed being no more than threepence. In one of these houses were found 58 persons of both sexes, the stench of whom was intolerable. This is a haunted place. The 60s tower block, centre point, stands on the site of what were once the worst slums in London's history. In its time, it too has been a shelter for homeless people, and vagrants still gather in its shadow. This area has always been the haunt of the poor and the outcast, the crowd of the forgotten. But in Georgian London, there was a new predator in this urban jungle, one which would be responsible for the deaths of many thousands of Londoners. Gin. A new kind of drunkenness, unknown to our ancestors, is lately sprung up amongst us and which, if not put a stop to, will infallibly destroy a great number of the inferior people. The gin shops are filled with men and women and even sometimes of children who drink so much that they find it difficult to walk on going away. The London crowd's appetite for gin seemed to threaten the very fabric of society. For half a century, gin was the demon spirit of London. It took possession of the people. In the 1740s, there were 17,000 gin houses in the city. The rage for gin erupted like a frenzy, as if the city itself had been seized by a sudden fever 
and the burning first. On Sunday evenings, half a million men and women with their children flood like a sea over the whole city, where till five in the morning they celebrate the Sabbath, that is to say, guzzle and get bestially drunk, drunk for a whole week. The artist William Hogarth's famous engraving Gin Lane was set in the parish of St Giles. There is no more brutally accurate depiction of gin as the crack cocaine of its day. The drunken mother, her expression one of oblivion beyond despair, letting her baby slip to its death, is nothing less than a case history. A woman called Judith DeFour strangled her two-year-old child for the price of its baby clothes to spend the money on gin. Gin rendered the London crowd more unpredictable and uncontrollable than ever and there was always the fear that it might become vicious. When George I came to the throne in 1714 he immediately passed the Riot Act. Like Fielding, he knew that the city authorities were powerless against the crowd. When a mob of chairmen or servants or a gang of thieves or sharpers are almost too big for the civil authority, what must be the case in a seditious tumult or general riot? In the modern city, with its ever-present police surveillance, it's difficult to imagine the unchecked ferocity of 18th century Londoners, most of whom were ready and willing to express their loyalties in the theatre of the streets. Old animosities ran deep, particularly against foreigners and Catholics. It was said that there were 10,000 Londoners ready to die for the cause against popery even if they weren't sure whether it was a man or a horse. The crowd could be whipped up to support almost any cause or settle any score. In an atmosphere of political and religious controversy, there was no civic authority and certainly no police force to restrain it. It was the rampant political animal at the heart of the city. It was the mob. The word mob was coined as a new name for the London crowd after a Pope burning procession in 1680. On that occasion, an effigy of the Pope was stuffed with live cats before it was paraded through the streets. The Riot Act was intended to be the ultimate weapon of control against the mob but it had little effect. Throughout the century, there were riots attacking the Irish, riots on behalf of the weavers, riots in defence of cheap gin, riots during almost every election meeting. Each riot had its target, but the target was never London itself. Despite this history of turbulence, the mob has never taken control of the city. But during the Gordon riots in the summer of 1780, it came dangerously close to doing so. It all began when Lord George Gordon organised an anti-Catholic march to Parliament. His supporters were described as the better sort of tradesmen, but no crowd in London remains unmixed for long. Ignatius Sancho, who kept a grocer's shop a few hundred yards from the Houses of Parliament, was an eyewitness. At least a hundred thousand poor, miserable, ragged rabble from 12 to 60 years of age with blue cockades in their hats. Besides half as many women and children were all parading in the streets, the park, the bridge, ready for any and every mischief. The mob, the horrid clashing of swords, and the clatter of the multitude in swiftest motion drew me to my door. 
where everyone else in the street was employed in shutting up shop. The crowd marched in a column four miles long, carrying banners declaring no popery. When they converged on Westminster, they raised a great yell. The heat inflamed them as they invaded the lobbies and corridors of Parliament. They threatened to burst into the chamber when a report spread that armed soldiers were coming. The crowd was ejected from Westminster, a few were arrested and taken to Newgate, but the rest of the city was theirs. The contagion of the crowd's disorder spread like a fever. A fragile equilibrium had been upset, and violence and looting, fires and destruction broke out all over the city. I am not sorry I was born in Africa. A thousand madmen armed with clubs and bludgeons set off for Newgate to liberate, they say, their honest comrades. That night, the sky above London turned to the colour of blood. 36 major fires were started. The prisons of the fleet, the clink and the king's bench were alight. The mobs unleashed their anger on the prisons because they understood that London was a prison. That was why it was inevitable that they should finally take their vengeance against Newgate itself. More than 300 prisoners were liberated. Some were escaping imminent execution and were like men resurrected. A bonfire was lit and every stick of prison furniture was burnt. It was an exorcism. The keys to the jail were paraded at the end of a pole, emblems of the prison's bad magic. The mob didn't stop there. There were unseen centers of energy, unseen swirls of activity, it stalked through the streets like some phantom or monster. It was out of control, but it chose its targets with unerring accuracy. The greatest losses have fallen on the great distiller near Holborn Bridge and Lord Mansfield, the Lord Chief Justice. The former has lost his whole fortune, and the latter, one of the finest law libraries in the kingdom, Shall we call it a judgment? The thunder of their vengeance has fallen on gin and law, the two most inflammatory things in the Christian world. The mob was finally confronted when it attacked the Bank of England in the very heart of the city. Here, the army and the volunteers of the London Military Association stood their ground and opened fire. The next day, the military were in control. It is estimated that more than 700 people lost their lives. There was no firm conclusion on the causes of the riots. They were compared to a discharge of lightning a grounding of the energy of the city. It was the bloodiest rebellion of its people in London's history. The city had come closer to being demolished by its own crowd than at any other moment, before or since. But London didn't fall, it never does. 
it is too large and too complex to be moved by riot or by mayhem. The London crowd is powerless in its presence. Stony-hearted and unyielding, it wavers slightly and then continues on its relentless course.